anything too bad about me. Let me show you a, see if we've got this. Oh, there we go. So as Han was just saying, you know, I, I came to Microsoft 21 years ago to start Microsoft Research. Now, the environment that I came out of was a, a university environment, just like the environment that you have. You know, I came from Carnegie Mellon University, and, and really that was where I learned to do basic research. That was the environment in which I, I built my career. And so when I came to Microsoft 21 years ago, I came with the mission of really creating a basic, basic research organization that was like the environment that I had at Carnegie Mellon. I really wanted to create the equivalent of a Carnegie Mellon computer science department, but in the context of a software company, in the context of a company like Microsoft. Now, in those days, 21 years ago, Microsoft was a very small company. Now, I know for many of you that may be hard to believe. We had just a few products. We had a few thousand employees. And really, it wasn't the kind of company that you would necessarily think would want to invest in long-term basic research. But the board of directors made an important decision. They decided that it was important to invest in the future and invest in the long term. And that's when they came to me, and that's when I came to Microsoft. Now, as I said, you know, my goal was to create the kind of environment that you have in a university, but do it in the context of a company. And in the course of doing that, very early, really at the beginning of Microsoft Research, I adopted a mission statement that I thought would lead the organization, you know, through its history to do just that. So first and foremost, you see the first left-hand side of there, of that uh, slide. That's the first part of the mission statement. And the first part of Microsoft Research's mission statement is to expand the state of the art in the areas that we're doing research. And that's really not that different than what you would be doing if you were doing research in a university. Notice there's nothing about that statement that says anything about Microsoft. What that's really saying is that if we're going to do basic research in an area, we want to make sure that we're pushing the state of the art that we're advancing the knowledge of mankind in that particular field or that particular area. Because if we're not able to do that, then ultimately I believe that we were not going to be very valuable to Microsoft. We have to be at the cutting edge. Now, the second part of the mission statement you see in the middle there does relate to Microsoft. It says that when we have good ideas, when we have solutions to problems, when we have new technologies, we work really hard to get those into practice and to get those into use. And of course, the best way for us to do that is to work through our product groups and to get those ideas and technologies into Microsoft products, because those products go out to over a billion people around the world. Now, ultimately, the goal is really that last one, and that's to ensure that Microsoft has a future. So why would a company like Microsoft invest in basic research when it was very small. It's because it believed it was going to have a future, and it believed that that investment would help it realize that future. Now, we've grown from basically just me, uh, you know, 20, 21 years ago, to now having research labs all around the world. In fact, more people work for Microsoft Research outside the United States than inside the United States. If you look at that map, you see our research labs in Redmond, Washington, Mountain View, California, New England, New York, Cambridge, England, Bangalore, India, Beijing, China. And you also see a number of our advanced technology labs in Egypt, in Israel, Germany. So really, we've grown and we've expanded over the years. Uh, and we've just continued to to move forward as an organization. Now, I, I said earlier that you know, Microsoft made a decision very early in its life to invest in long-term basic research. 
a lot of people, when they think about basic research, whether in a university or in a company, they look at it and they say, well, why do you invest in it? It costs a lot of money. It doesn't necessarily produce immediate results. You know, if you're doing research in a university, you're not necessarily producing products. You're not necessarily producing immediate financial benefit for anyone. So why make those investments? The same thing is true for, for a company like Microsoft. There are three answers that I think people most often give. And while they're true in a way, they're not necessarily the whole truth. Some people will say, well, I know why you invest in basic research. You're doing it because you want to create intellectual property. You want to create technologies that are going to go into your, into your products. And that's certainly true. I mean, for Microsoft Research, we create more patents for Microsoft than any other part of the company. Our patents are arguably of more scientific value. In fact, the IEEE uh, has rated Microsoft's patent portfolio as having the highest scientific value in the field. And the technologies we create have a huge impact on our, project, on our products. So that's great. But I would argue that's not the main reason you invest in basic research, but it's certainly a great benefit. Another idea, another thing that people suggest as a reason for investing in basic research is the second point, which is problem solving. We have great people. We have really smart people. Just as you and the university have great people and very smart people, we really are good at solving problems. In fact, I just love solving problems. You, you come with me, to me with a problem, you know, I love just figuring out what the issues are, trying to find a solution. It's, it's a lot of fun. I've been trained to do it. I'm pretty good at it. And the people that we hire are very good at it. So certainly that's a benefit to a company like Microsoft. And in a university environment, you could say it's a benefit to the, to the society that you're able to solve problems. But again, it's not the, the main reason, I think, that we do the investment. Sometimes people say, well, OK, I know why you have an investment in basic research. You're a, you know, you're, you're a early warning system. right? You, you can see the future because you see what's in the research labs. And so you can tell the company, when there's a, a, a new technology or something coming on the horizon. And we do that. But none of those things, I think, are really the fundamental reason why you invest in basic research. They're all incredible benefits, but they're not the fundamental reason. The fundamental reason you invest in basic research is really for survival. You know, if you're a, a, com a country or a society you invest in basic research because you believe it's going to be important when there's going to be a problem in the future to have the smart people and the ideas and the technologies that allows your society to survive. Vannevar Bush, uh, who helped to create the National Science Foundation in the United States, he wrote a paper on this subject that really argued that the United States should invest in fundamental basic research. This was right after World War II that we should invest in basic research because if there's a new war or a famine or a disease, then the country would have the intellectual resources to survive that. Well, I think for a company like Microsoft, it's really the same thing. You know, if there's a new competitor, if there's a new technology, if there's a change in the business climate, then you really want to have the people and the technology and the ideas that will let you change rapidly when change is necessary, that will let you adapt to a new world when you have to adapt quickly. And I think it's a statement about the, the value that Microsoft Research has brought to Microsoft that Microsoft still exists today. Because the frank reality is that almost none of the companies that were Microsoft's peers 21 years ago still exist. They're almost all gone. And even the few that may still be around don't do the same things anymore. They're not relevant. So really, it's about survival. And investments in basic research are about survival, whether that's survival for a society or whether it's survival for a company. Now, Microsoft Research, in its 21 years, has had a tremendous impact on the company. Many of the 
pieces of Microsoft that you think of today originally came out of Microsoft Research. So what became the digital media division of the company and now is an important part of our entertainment and, and uh, devices business, the Xbox and things of that sort, our music business, that was something that was created by me in Microsoft Research. We turned it into a product group and we spun it out to our product organizations in 1996. I started the first e-commerce group in the company. All the natural language and speech technologies in Windows and Office came out of Microsoft Research. So we have consistently created the technologies that have helped to drive the company forward and create actually large parts of the company that you see today. You see on the screen just a few of the products that we've had an impact on. Really every product that you get from Microsoft has had some influence for Microsoft Research, whether that's in the technologies that, that are underlie the product, whether it's in some cases the product itself, or whether it's the technologies that are used to create the product. Now I'm going to show you a, a, a short video to show off a very particular technology that, that has come out of Microsoft Research, really come out of fundamental basic research in program analysis and program generation. And it is now having a huge impact in the most recent version of Microsoft Office that's just now being released. So the technology is called Flash Fill, and I'll let the video speak for itself. I'm Sumit Gulwani from Microsoft Research Redmond. I'm going to tell you about a new feature in Excel 2013 called Flash Fill, which had its origins in Microsoft Research. Suppose you have a collection of social security numbers that you see in the first column, and you want to format them by inserting hyphens, as you see in the second column. If you have hundreds and thousands of these rows, then doing it manually would be very cumbersome. A more principled way to do this would be to write an Excel macro. But if you are a non-programmer, like most Excel users, then you would be stuck. But now you can use the Flash Fill feature to automate this task by just the press of Control E, which is a shortcut for Flash Fill. The Flash Fill feature builds over our program synthesis technology that can generalize examples into programs. So this is the opposite of program verification methodology that is used to generate test cases from programs to expose bugs in those programs. And this has seen decades of research. But now program synthesis does the reverse. It takes test cases or examples and generates programs that are consistent with those examples. In fact, we generate a huge number of such programs, but we have efficient data structures and algorithms to compute and represent such programs. Then we use the machine learning technology to rank these programs. We take the highest ranked program and run it on all the rows in the spreadsheet to give the user the output that they desire. Now in general, it might not be possible to learn the user's intent from just one example, as would be shown by the second scenario, where I have a bunch of medical billing codes, some of which are missing a right bracket at the end, while some of which have a right bracket. Suppose my goal is to clean this data by adding a right bracket wherever it is missing. So if I give one example, then Flashfill generalizes it into a simplest program, which is to add a right bracket everywhere. Maybe this is what the user wanted. But otherwise, the user would observe that row 6 to row 10 are all incorrect, and the user can fix any one of these rows. So the moment I fix row 6, then Flashville is able to fix other similar rows accordingly. Flashville can also be used to perform complicated extraction tasks. So consider this worksheet that has a lot of customer data in the first column. So suppose my goal is to extract the constituent elements. All that I have to do is to give an example in each column and hit Control E. Flashville can also synthesize programs that have limited form of conditionals and loops, as is illustrated by this scenario where I want to generate an abbreviation. If you want to learn more about this technology, then you can look at our CSCM Research Highlights paper. You can also use this feature yourself in Excel 2013. So what I find really exciting about Flashfill is that this is really the first time that automatic program synthesis is being distributed out in a mass market product. We're suddenly giving ordinary people the ability to automatically create effectively new programs that transform their data simply by giving a few examples. This is fundamental basic research being applied in a very simple and easy to use way 
that anybody can take advantage of. And the consumer preview of Office 2013 is freely available for download. So I suggest if you're interested in seeing how this works, download it. It's just purely magic to play with it. Now, one of the, the big changes that's been going on in the field of computer science in the last few years comes from the fact that we have built the world's largest database systems, huge data centers. We're collecting enormous amounts of information. And we're providing an environment in where, where processors can access that. So this, this new world is sometimes referred to as the world of big data, where suddenly you have not just terabytes of information available, but many, many petabytes of information. And it's letting us think about new ways in which we can solve the world's problems. For example, you may want to collect all the information from all the hospitals and all the doctors to try to come up with new understandings of the way in which the, you can provide a solution for different diseases. People are looking at genetics and they're saying if we could just collect all the genetic information from a large population, suddenly we can tackle diseases like AIDS or hepatitis C or malaria that we never had an ability to do before. Or suddenly we can attack the problem of personalized medicine. We can design medicines that work for specific individuals and know that they're going to be deadly for other individuals. Now, one of the projects we have going on in Microsoft Research in Cambridge is looking at the problem of, of the world's climate and the world's ecology. And we're using the notion of big data to tackle that problem. We're collecting information that comes from many different sources about the world's climate and making it available for scientists and researchers around the world. So I'm going to run a short video to show you that. The, the, the name of the system is called Fetch Climate. I'm a researcher at Microsoft Research Cambridge, where I'm in the Computational Ecology and Environmental Science Group. The mission of that group is to carry out computational science that should let humanity manage our natural resources better. As part of that research mission, we develop new software tools, predictive models, and geographical information services that should allow people to carry out that kind of cutting edge research more widely. Today, I'd like to show you Fetch Climate, which is an easy, fast way for anyone to extract complex information about the climate, either just with a few lines of code in a program or even just through a browser. So here's our browser running Fetch Climate. I'm in Redmond at Microsoft headquarters. So I'm going to zoom in on the area around Redmond. And I can just really easily draw a square here, which will populate a grid, and hit Fetch. And what's happening is this is a Silverlight application which is communicating with an Azure service. That service is looking over a, a large number of large data sets. And it's choosing the best data to answer the query. It's then doing a whole bunch of complex mathematical calculations and sending the result back to our application running in the browser. The answer of that query is now being visualized on top of Bing Maps via dynamic data display, which is another prototype tool that comes from our group. You can see that interactivity. If we hover the mouse over here, and we can see, for instance, that the average temperature in this place is about 2.8 degrees. We can download data. So we just hit download, we get a choice of formats. And we can see all the information that we would need from that query. It's got different times as well, so we can do a query for a fraction of the year or even a fraction of the day. And then we have the air temperature data itself. We have the um, provenance, so the data source that was used to supply this information. And we even have an estimate of uncertainty. That uncertainty is something that the experts find really hard to assign to data. That was a research project in its own right, and yet that's always supplied every time with a Fetch Climate query. Now, we can, for the browser version, we can run multiple copies of Fetch Climate at once. And so I'm going to show you a couple of examples of fetches that I did earlier. So here's one of wind speed over the eastern US. And that's the kind of thing that you might want to look at if you're an energy company or the government planning wind farms. And in this fetch, I put a string of locations across Africa. And for each of those locations, I've extracted 60 years worth of rainfall data. And we can just hover over one of those points 
and see what's happening to rainfall. And unfortunately, this looks pretty worrying because it looks like there's been a steady decline in rainfall over the past 60 years. It's the kind of thing we've probably all seen in the headlines recently, African droughts and so on. So thanks to Fetch Climate, anyone can get that kind of information really easily. It's live, it's ready, go and find it, have a go, and please tell us what you think. So again, the, uh, I think the, the, the key point here is that you know, we are now able to provide that kind of service to anyone, to individuals that want to learn about the, world's, the Earth's climate and the areas in which they live and how the climate has changed over the last few years or the last 60 years or the last 100 years, but more importantly to scientists because this kind of data is actually very difficult for scientists to accumulate themselves. But we're able to do that put the information in Windows Azure and provide a simple interface for people to be able to examine and, and look at. So that's a great application of big data, really helping to solve a problem that really helps the world. Now, the theme of this conference is, is this notion of, of being able to compute naturally. And I know a number of you have probably seen Xbox Connect, uh, and really Xbox the, the Connect part of Xbox was really the first time that real-time 3D computer vision was made available to ordinary people in their homes. And it really transformed the way people thought about the way they interacted with computers. Now, uh, my, me and my family were probably not surprisingly uh, on the beta uh, for Connect before it came out publicly. And I remember my two boys at the time, my young boys, they, they, at the time they were like nine and, and 10, I think. And I remember the first time they played with Connect. And what was interesting to me and what got me very excited about the product was the fact that not only did they enjoy playing the game, using their whole body to control the game, but they actually had more fun celebrating after they won the game. Because when they jumped up and down, their character on the screen jumped up and down. And you could see that they, in their minds, had made a connection between themselves and their own body and the character on the screen and the virtual body of that character. And that was very, very powerful. And I knew at that moment that we were going to have a tremendous hit. Now, what makes Connect work is really a lot of very exciting new research in machine learning and computer vision. And, that's a, and Connect was really a great example of Microsoft researchers working extremely closely with some of the tremendous people we have in our product organization to build a new kind of experience that really changed people's perceptions of the relationship between a computer and a human being. The fact that the computer now had senses like we did, it could see and could interact with us in kind of a physical way. That was new. That changed the way people thought. And not just the way people thought in the consumer marketplace, it changed the way research is done. Researchers around the world have adopted Connect as a technology that they can use to tackle new kinds of user interface problems. Now, Connect is, is one kind of solution to the problem of, of how do I interact with the computer system. In that case, there's a, a remote camera and there's you standing in front of it and you're gesturing. But what if somehow the camera was part of you or it was, it was on your person and the system was able to detect simpler personal actions that you might take? Well, some of our researchers have been looking into that problem and created a system called Digits and I'm gonna show you that video. Digits is a wrist-worn 3D hand tracker for gestural interactions on the move. Now, I've mentioned before that you know, Microsoft Research has, has, has grown to be a pretty large organization. We now have over 850 PhD researchers around the world, and we are the number one publisher of basic research in the field of computer science. But however big we might be, we're still a tiny fraction of the larger scientific and research community. And one of the things that has always been part of our mission, and something that I instituted as part of Microsoft Research in the very earliest days, 
our efforts to really reach out and work with the broader academic community and to support the creation of new talent, new scientists, new researchers uh, in both computer science but in, in the broader collection of sciences. So if you, if you look at some of the things that we're doing within Microsoft Research today, you might actually kind of wonder, gosh, that, that seems a little, uh, a little off the beaten path. We're looking at solutions to, to the problem of personalized medicine that I mentioned earlier. We're working with researchers in the AIDS community to find a vaccine for AIDS. We're coming up with new technologies to address the problem of, of hospital care and, and management of patients. We're looking at environmental modeling and we're looking at ways in which we can improve the purity of water in things like the Russian River Valley in California. We're also working to make sure that there's going to be a next generation of scientists. We fund fellowships and studentships around the world. We support faculty in their research, and we have a vibrant faculty fellowship program that we support in every region in which we operate. We run the largest PhD internship program in the world, with over 1,000 PhD interns working each year in some part of Microsoft Research. So those are really, in some sense, you know, that's part of the process that we believe is important that we have to go through in order to make sure that there really is going to continue to be a lot of great new ideas, a lot of great new technologies coming into not just the field of computer science, but into the engineering and science fields more broadly. Now, I, uh, I want to come back to the topic of natural user interfaces. One of the most natural interfaces for people is human speech. And for the last 60 years, computer scientists have been trying to find ways to understand and recognize human speech. Now, in the beginning, when people first started tackling this problem, they looked at it largely as a pattern matching problem. And the earliest systems attempted to take the waveforms that came out of a, a speaker's, speaker's voice and match them up to waveforms that they knew represented certain words. Unfortunately, that approach was extremely fragile, partly because everyone speaks differently, but also even a single speaker will often say the same thing differently depending on the other words or the context in which they're speaking. You've probably already noticed me doing that. Now, in the late 1970s, there was a major change in the way people decided to do speech recognition. This was work being done at Carnegie Mellon University. And the idea was to use a statistical modeling technique, in this case, hidden Markov models, to make the trans, to, to really be able to take a lot of data from many speakers and produce more robust statistical models of speech. Now, that was a huge improvement. And over the last 30 years, speech recognition systems have become dramatically better than they used to be. They still make a lot of mistakes. But in, in limited domains, it's possible to do very successful speech interfaces. So for example, in the United States, when I call my bank, I'm talking to a computer. I'm not talking to a person. The computer can answer simple questions about my bank account, or if necessary, it can connect me to a real person if I have a significant issue that I want to discuss. I'm sure you've heard of, of Apple's Siri product, which answers simple questions. Microsoft Connect has a robust speech interface that allows you to control the interface, and it even allows you to issue commands in the middle of games. Still, these systems have a lot of errors. And the error rates 
for arbitrary speech have been in the 20 to 25 percent range. Well, a few years ago, researchers at, at Microsoft Research and at the University of Toronto came together to develop what's a, another breakthrough in the field of speech recognition research. The idea that they had was to use a technology in, in a way patterned after the way the human brain works. It's called deep neural networks. And to use that to take in much more data than had previously been able to be used with the hidden Markov models and use that to significantly improve recognition rates. So that one change, that particular breakthrough, increased recognition rates by approximately 30%. That's a big deal. That's the difference between going from 20 to 25% errors, or about one error out of every four or five words, to roughly 15% or slightly less errors, roughly one out of every seven words, or perhaps even one out of every eight. So it's still not perfect. There's still a long way to go. But I think you can see that we have already made a significant amount of additional progress in the recognition of speech. Now, one of the problems that we've also been trying to solve for 60 years is machine translation. And again, in just the last few years, the combination of statistical techniques and big data have allowed us to do a much better job than we previously were able to do in being able to translate web pages or other kinds of information into other languages. For example, today, Bing Translate, which is Microsoft's translation system that comes out of Microsoft Research, Bing Translate translates millions of pages a day for users into their native language. It's an extremely heavily used service. Now, if I want to have what I'm saying be translated into Chinese, we can take the text that comes from my voice and put that through a translation system. It really happens in two steps. In the first instance, we take the English and we convert it more or less word by word into, into Chinese text. And I think pretty soon we may see that up on the screen. So what happens is we're basically taking the English text and pushing it through the translation system. We then have to reorder that text in Chinese because the word order in Chinese is not the same as the word order in English to produce something that begins to resemble something that a Chinese speaker might say. So now we're taking the things that I'm saying and we're converting them into Chinese text. Now, the last step that I want to be able to take in this process is to actually speak to you in Chinese. Now, the key thing there is we've been able to take a large amount of information from many Chinese speakers and produce a text-to-speech system that takes Chinese text and converts it into Chinese language. And then we've taken an hour or so of my own voice, and we've used that to modulate the standard text-to-speech system so that it would sound like me. So what you see now is the result of that change. I'm speaking in English, and hopefully you'll hear me speak in Chinese in my own voice. Again, the results are not perfect. There are, in fact, quite a few errors. There's much work to be done in this area. But this technology is very promising. 
，用这个技术很有希望。And we hope in a few years that we'll be able to break down the language barriers between people. 数年后，我们希望能够打破人们之间的语言障碍。Personally, I believe this is going to lead to a better world. I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations today. Thank you. Thank you.